Yeah. 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 Uh, All right, the uh, Thursday, May 4th meeting of the Water Quality Management Committee will come to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is the IA management plan. The, uh, there's been a working group. John and Steve and myself have been, and Thea have been toiling away on this. It, it's, uh, it's been through quite a number of iterations. It's probably not done yet, but it's ready for prime time as far as the committee having a look at it. Mm. And uh, do you have a slide thing for it, or, or do we want to verbally? I, I didn't put a slide. Okay. I, I, I sent it around. Okay, everyone's got so a copy. Everyone should have so a... there's just one little correction on page two, uh, section 4.4, .4, the last paragraph. It now reads monitored, but once per year. And that really should read monitored at least once per year. Yes. That's my. I think that's the last of the good news. Well, John, you want to walk people, walk people through it? Uh, our nationwide TV audience and the enterprise apparently isn't up this early. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we're being recorded. I <laughs> yeah. saw IFCTV. <laughs> so would that make sense to actually just kind of I walk? Don't, do I we, think a, a lot. Do we, do we need to walk through it again? Uh, uh, well, we might as well. I, there was one meeting that you missed, and so with, oh, with the committee, I, I walked through it section by section. Oh, okay, so that's been done. Okay, I, I, if we're still on the but once change to at least, um, that corrects the internal inconsistency here, I, I think. Um, I, I had pointed out to John just last night <laughs> Um, that in 4.6 it says it's to be inspected, which means the physical operation of it twice annually. And if it hasn't had a uh, water quality monitoring sample taken within at least 30 days of that inspection, then um, there would be a sample taken. So that drove me to say that obviously the but once isn't, isn't correct. It's going to be likely twice a year. Uh, yeah. and, and John has just um, mentioned that it might actually be three times a year. So I, I think there needs to be some discussion on that because I, I think, personally, I, I think that that's um, a lot. I, I, I think that the homeowners probably will, will um, object to that. That's my hunch. I don't think we can get away with anything less. I, see. I mean, the once random per year yes. just, just randomly says, okay, here, here's a shot at what's going on okay. without prejudicing it by planning when those samples are taken. And according to George, you can't ask an inspector to go and inspect something if he doesn't have any idea how it's functioning. I see. And so yeah. he needs to have, at least within 30 days, a sample taken so that when he goes to inspect it, he knows whether the thing's functioning or not. Okay. Can I just follow that thought, whether I agree with it or not? If it's going to be inspected at least twice a year, and if there's been no sample within 30 days, there will be a sample taken. Why don't you just say that within each inspection there will be a sample? Because one of those random samples could have been within 30 days. Oh, I see. Yeah. Are there's a one out of 12 chance that it will. One out of, <coughs> yes, right. There's also, I think John pointed this out, that the, the RME, the town, Yes. Entity that's responsible for this. It's in their interest to schedule the inspections when possible, one of the two, right after one of the random tests, whenever they can. So this would reduce it from three to two. This way to two. Yeah. I think I think we have yeah. to build some flexibility into that. And I think you have to assume that the guy who's running the program yeah. is going to realize that He's got to differentiate between seasonal houses and year rounds. There are going to be some systems yes. which are more problematic than others. Yes. He's got to have a little bit of leeway to decide, okay, I need to keep my eye on these, mm -hmm. and I don't have to keep my eye on these quite as much. Okay. So I think that's just building in a little bit of cushion mm -hmm. that lets your, your, you have to assume your operator is, you know, with it. With it, okay. And, and the other thing is, it's my understanding that the, the purpose of this document at this point is so that you and Eric can take it to DEP or whoever and see if it flies. 
And so you don't want to fine polish it too much too before much. you get their input. It's okay. a waste of our time. All right. Well, to be a little more correct, the purpose of this document is to fulfill our contractual obligation to the county, who gave us 75000 bucks to put together a, a model. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. A, a model of, uh, of a management <coughs> program for IAs. Um, part of that may involve what, what you just said, but, but, but the purpose, it's, it's a little more broad. Uh, in, in, in yeah, that, that's fine, but it, it still makes sense right. to not, even if it's a, a product that they're purchasing from us, yeah. to not fine polish it too much right. without seeing their opinion of it. Sure. <coughs> um, I just, I haven't seen anything from George Hoyfelder on this. Has he... George has been involved throughout the process. Right. Yeah, I know, but I haven't seen any any, any comment from him on, on it. But I suppose that's just because we haven't, it hasn't been distributed to the Right, being a work in progress. But, but the, yeah. So on this, though, I thought there was like a couple of things. One was that, there were really two points on this, right? This whole going to DEP. One is that the 10 milligram per liter acceptability by the state. That is first and foremost, I think, is a target. Essential. Okay. Essential, right. That's, right. The, that's it. And the second thing had to do with now what we're talking about, the monitoring side, to try and get those costs down because they're rather prohibitive. So if we, um, uh, if we send it up the flagpole, so to speak, um, and see how, it, how it's uh, looked at at that point with those elements they may come back with other aspects about um, about it so but I think nailing down what is really practical and, and reasonable in terms of monitoring is important so it um, I would say less is more if we think it would be effective mm -hmm. at that lesser uh, modality or, le or least modality so to speak yeah. so anyway but that's those are my uh, my sense I, I, I agree with you 100% yeah. Oh, oh, so, I'm, I'm looking at the universe. Mark, wait, wait, as the lawyer say, mark the date. And <laughs> 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 the record will show. I, I was just going to say, should I put that in a minute? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, I'm looking at sort of the, the last 30 or 40 or 50 years of DEP and wastewater and and you sort of have two ends of a spectrum. Okay. With great effort and great public horror and, and pushback. They, they put Title V in, what, 1995 or thereabouts. And that's basically a, it's a, obviously a weight improvement over cesspools or, or uh, steel tanks or whatever else people yep. had in the ground. But it's basically put it in the ground and forget it. Yep. And the only time you ever get to see what happened down there is when you sell it and, and somebody comes and says, is it still working? <laughs> yeah. And that's it. Okay, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is what they do at septic treatment plants, which is you got to monitor it, you got to test it, you got to send us results very frequently. Uh, if it's if there's any deviancy, we're right on you. You've got to show us what you're going to do. You got to file papers. It's a huge burden, and and sort of the issue is which end of the spectrum is this thing going to end up at? Because if it ends up anywhere near the septic treatment model, it's a dead duck. Yeah. It, it won't be publicly acceptable. It won't be financially acceptable. It won't work. So, so uh, and we've got to do everything we can to push it toward the least intrusive model. I think the one thing you have to understand is this is not a Title V arrangement. I get that. This is this is proposing to the state um, our attempt to use IAs to meet a TMDL, and that's a very different thing than uh, an individual IA system uh, being permitted and functioning. So what we have to do with this document is to persuade the state that we can keep enough of an eye on these things that they can be confident that we're going to be able to meet and maintain a TMDL with them. And that's the very distinct difference between this and talking about Title V. The other piece that we run into sort of toward the end of this is the money piece. In the, with a sewer, it's zero percent finance if, if we get it, which we got it, and, and it's available, and we probably can get it. So the entire, 
the entire cost, 30% of the cost is paid by the town, and the other 70% is, is borrowed by the town it's at 0% financing. That, that same option is not available <coughs> for this kind of model. You know, you're, you're charging market rates of interest on this, even if the, even if the town put up 30% of town money to help the homeowner, the 70% is going to be at, at market rates. That really skewers the formula a lot, to, uh, and that's something that we have no control over, but it's something we may have to say is a deal breaker if if, if it isn't going to be available at, at a more reasonable financial cost. I, I think that that is an issue that we should tackle just the way when we were looking at Little Pond, we were, uh, we were trying to find ways to reduce costs to the owners, homeowners. And just because the, the current lending rate is anywhere between 2 and 5 percent doesn't mean that, that we can't work on that. But that, um, right now, the cost that you've, um, you've done some sort of back of the envelope cost for, for this. Um, and do they include the borrowing part no. for the no? It has just to do with the monitoring, just with the monitoring and right. inspection and pumping, which would then be covered by a fee that's paid twice a year. Okay. So just on Eric, on, on what you said, I, I think actually what's available to people is is higher than market rate, because it's sort of from the county. It's sort of like the they consider the option of last resort which is 5% over right. 20 years. Yes. So that's, we, we learned yeah. something interesting about that county yeah. program, which uh -huh. is they get it from the state at zero. Right. So the 5% is their handling charge. And right. They use that to pay their own salaries and, and overhead and, and other county expenses. So, so there's nothing that says it has to be 5%. Right. Well, I know, but, they've, I, but that's where they are. So the, they may The change. town yeah. could take advantage of that same program borrow it from zero right. and lend it to zero. But that's only for failed septic systems. It, it, it doesn't cover this. Yes. Oh, but I thought we agreed that if, if there's a requirement for IAs, then by definition, regular Title Fives have failed. I, I think we might push that. <laughs> I thought that was, I, I thought that was the assumption from the earlier discussion. If you were going to require them in an area, by definition, you were going to right. declare those systems failed. We, we could all agree on that. A blanket the, condemnation. The, the state SRF right. fund statute has to agree on that. Right. But it's something you might ask them. Absolutely. Well, so, yeah. J John, do you, do you know if the, uh, if the Board of Health has declared all of the septic systems in the Little Pond sewer service area as failed? I thought there was some, something that then, that yeah. then make, obligates now, the them to... The Board of Health was not involved with that. Not involved, okay. So. The town laid out a sewer service area, yeah, and then said, "If if you fall within those boundaries, you're yeah, required to look up." up. Okay. So all we've done is, uh, in the interim, before hookups were available, if systems failed in Little Pond, we held them. We said, "You've got a failed system, but we realize you're going to be hooking to the sewer. So if you do these things, we'll allow you to okay. keep that failed system." until the sewer is so, so it wasn't a blanket thing it was just we did that individually right, right. house by house as systems fail now for the purpose of taking that state tax credit they have all been deemed failed and, yeah, and, 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 and there was a letter sent around oh. by town council that, yes. that, that now spelled that out right. and that was by by the who declared them who is the board of selectmen was that the uh, i don't know i have to get frank's letter here but it, it oh. It gave the homeowner the, the explanation when they come to fill out their taxes. I see. Okay. So that's a fine legal point, whether that kind of legal failing is the it's same as the legal failing that you want for this. Right. 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 It should be. It should be the same because it should be the same. It, 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 think, it, be the same, but well, it, may, it may take us a while to get there. It may take some statutory be, Because it's, it, it may. Yeah. Um, it's going to well, this, because it's brand new. Everything, everything we're doing here is basically yeah. brand new. <coughs> oh, uh, mine, mine are just little housekeeping things. This okay. is so heavily <laughs> philosophical. Um, if we go back to, to um, paragraph 4.2 structure, um, under the jurisdiction of the, I assume it's an agency, not an individual. It should be which rather than who? That first, that last paragraph which on made, page one. Yeah, 4 point, page one. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a department probably. Right, then I would put so which, which instead of who. Right. That's minor. 
Um, and then in 4.4, the end of that second paragraph, there should be a space between within and one. Again, a little help. Oh, yeah. Where? Uh, if a it's you mean after one year? Bring into compliance within one year, the last sentence in the oh, second paragraph. Oh, there it paragraph. is, got it, yep. And uh, then following John's rationale at the bottom of that page where it says inspected not less than twice annually, I would say at least twice annually, I just think, instead of not less than. Now where is that? At the very last, last line. Very on page, page two. two. very last line under operation and maintenance. 4.6. Yeah, 4.6. Section 4.6, first sentence. At least, to just to well, be parallel structure. Yeah, it would be the same census. How, how often does the county inspect now? Dep it depends, uh, you know, the state, uh, they're, they're doing the West Falmouth things, what, once a month? Um, well, that's a demonstration that, project. Yeah, so what the county, research project. What the county does standard-wise for the existing systems that it's are there quarterly. for compliance is quarterly, and then you can apply to the Board of Health for twice a year. If no. you've got reduction to once a once year. Once a year, thank you. If uh, your you've consistency of your eight data. Successive measurements that have met the nineteen. Ah, so that's after two years then. Right. Okay. Which is what we know. Well, that's there's, there's, there's a, yes, so there's, there's a standard. That, that they will back off to once a year. Yeah. Well that makes you wonder whether we're perhaps not asking for enough of a reduction. At it's least a, for an initial. <laughs> <laughs> this, Eric? Comes, this comes back to the discussion I just had with you. This is not a Title V arrangement. Yeah, okay. This is a TMDL compliance. Thing. But the question was, how often does the county inspect IA systems? And if the answer is once a year, that, that's informative. The, the county does it four times a year until for they've years. made eight right. successive measurements. Right. Right. Years. And then you can come and ask, and that's not the county, that's the Falmouth Board of Health. That's not DEP, that's Falmouth. Can we just go back to, did we change um, the last sentence on page two, 4.6, operation and maintenance, at least twice annually? Did we change that? I'm just trying to keep track of the. I think we agreed on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure. I mean, I think if you've got editorial comments, we've said the editorial comments are one thing, but the substantive stuff we need to right. discuss. Right, and then getting yes. back to the substance thing, when we go back to the watershed boundary, um, it looks, there's a two-step approval process here. The, the watershed boundaries are delineated by the management plan and by town meeting. Yes. Yes. So. Absolutely. Okay, but. Would town meeting approve the management plan and then by definition approve its its minutia or not? Town, I mean, town no. meeting does not, not approve sure. its It has CW. to be done separately. Okay, right. I'm, I'm the just board not of up selectmen. to speed on that right. process. Okay. No, right. Yeah, uh, a, a property owner must know whether he's in or out. Right. And that's why it's a town meeting decision that okay. clearly draws the boundaries Good. and then it appears on all town GIS okay. maps thereafter. Um, okay. But the minutia of how it works, that's left to Department of Public Works or Board of Health or whatever. Yeah, okay, good. And then I know we discussed this before, but, but philosophically, uh, the start of the project, I just could, could we get a better... Ah, this is in the first paragraph? Yeah, and it, it comes up again, too, a couple other places. I mean, we... Designated problems. Two meetings ago, I guess, we spent... Yeah, we had problems with that at the working group. I, it, it seems to me that the... It's loose. What happens here is... Uh, in the case of Little Pond, once the, DE, the DPW decides that the lift stations are in, everything's ready to operate, they say, okay, now you may hook up. And you have a certain time period that you're supposed to hook up by. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the same thing, that once you've uh, delineated this, you've made the votes, you've decided this is how you're going to approach this project, then the, deep, the, 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 the managing entity says, okay, this is the start date of the project. You <coughs> now have to what, the so suggestion. I have a solution. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the same one. Um, how about, you say, within four days, four years of, a, of 
a start date declared by the town. That's exactly the declared terminology I was going to recommend was declaration of initiation or declaration <coughs> of start, something along that line, so that it's a discrete date. Right, yes. and, and, and I think it should be declared by the RME, the right. Responsible Management Entity. Yeah. Okay. So where does that go? Okay, okay. so starting in the Anywhere it says start of the process. <coughs> I'm changing in the first third, third line down on the first paragraph, four years of a start date as determined? Yeah. Declared, or declared. As declared. As declared. Because by, it needs the declaration let me place please, it's as declared by the RME. Good point. Yeah. You could yes. determine it without declaring it. Right. <laughs> no yeah. one would know. Right. <laughs> it's a secret, but I could tell you. <laughs> Okay. All right, as declared right by, <laughs> and does that want to be bold? I don't think that RME wants to be bold. Maybe it does. Yes, RME is bold everywhere. Yeah, all right, start to, and then we'll search. You might want to spell it out the first time. Right. Well, there's a glossary. We haven't done that with anything. We've had a glossary at the yeah, end. Glossary, glossary at the end, all right. Uh, okay, and then in 3.0, you have it's with water pet within one year yep. of, and then you'd have the same language. Well, if, do you need, you've said the start of the project up top. You don't, oh. I don't think you need to repeat it again. Okay, all right. I agree. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, wait a minute. You, we no longer say the start of the project at the top. We say the start date declared. Start date declared. So and then the in problem? subsequent, it's three Why other. Why don't we just say, just say start date? Start within, yes. within one year of the start date. Uh -huh. Good period. point. Yes. Less words. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm agreeing with Ron again. That <laughs> usually, in any kind of a document, the first time you mention something, you spell it out, and thereafter you can use your acronym. But yes. But I, you, you I don't like make that. people go to the glossary but every, every the, time they want to see what three initials are about. The, the rationale for this was this document is going to DEP. They know every one of these acronyms by heart. Why make them fudge around reading text that they don't need to read? I mean, when they see TMDL, yeah. they don't, they, they don't have to think about it. It'd be one thing if this was going to the public. That's well, a good point. Wait, does this go to the selectmen first before it goes to DEP? No. no, no. Well, once again, this is a project <coughs> that we're doing on behalf of, uh, of the county uh, for the 75,000 dollar grant, so we have some leeway here. Should we have a vote on the acronyms? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should spell them out. It's a real pet. Do we hear a motion? Acronym is short for acrimonious. The standard, the well, standard in academia yeah. is the first time you yep. say yeah. something, yeah. you write it out and you put, wait, because you're academics. <laughs> 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 if you look at RFPs from DEP, yeah. they talk about TMDLs, BMPs, CWMPs, and they ne they do not in their grant applic you know requires how I mean I was because I was curious so it, it, there's absolutely a clear standard in academia but the rest of us are allowed to do it wrong um, so I, I you know well, do we have a motion I move that we spell it out at the first occurrence second. and leave the acronyms thereafter moved and seconded for the discussion for the discussion. I just, I just think it clutters up the document for DEP. But it's only going to be once per string, right, John? I well, mean, it's a minor look, thing to me. Look, look how many times you go through what that involves. But it's only once per no, occurrence, the, first the initial time occurrence, time and then that's it. So there's maybe 10 times that happens. Right? Okay, so, so I have make, a you do a lot of work so you're adding for words. academic it's purity fine. or... I have a question. No. So with the first paragraph, it says enhanced IAs, yeah. but the title we've had, we have advanced IAs and then we say innovative alternative yeah. septic system. So it's there. Is that the first time or is it in the text that it's the first time? I'd suggest in the text, but also again, I noticed now there's an apostrophe missing in the title. <laughs> there, no. If you're going to use one down here, again, it it's not, it's not a possessive. No, but you've used it down here in the first I, one. I, I just took it out because that was another mistake. Oh. It should not have an apostrophe S. Well, usually with acronyms, well. Okay. Further discussion on the motion, which, which is right. Sorry. Um, the, the first iteration of, a, of, a, uh, of an acronym that it be spelled out and not thereafter. 
with the understanding that this is an in, uh, this is a rough draft or final draft right. that is to be discussed with a regulatory agency that understands these acronyms. But we are posting this. This is publicly posted. We're posting. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, all right. I've oh, we are. I, I, for is, different well, I would think, in the interest of, of transparency, it, I think it, I think you've got to be open topic. about it. Yeah. Yeah. We. It, it, and my point. concern is, someone picks this up and reads it. We're going to be frustrated because every right. every three lines they've got to right. look back to see. Right. Well, it's still a work in progress, but sometimes yes. it won't be. In, sure. In, in so you're going to eliminate the glossary? No, right. keep the glossary. <laughs> uh, for the discussion. So a, a yes vote keeps the glossary and it spells out spells out the first instance the first of instance. everything. Right. And a no vote keeps the glossary and doesn't spell out. Okay. Correct. For the discussion. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. <laughs> <laughs> we may end up with four pages, John. Okay, so <laughs> total <laughs> nitrogen per liter, I, TN yeah, per L. Look at the first um, concentration in the first paragraph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Do I write point. that out the uh, first time? It, you know, we have um, here. It gets oh. ridiculous. Okay, yeah, I, I would, oh, okay. I would just write out Ron's got the floor total here. nitrogen per liter. I wouldn't. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I discussed this uh, with Steve as a, a member of the group. Um, we have the performance monitoring uh, section, 4.4, and I had provided some language for, um, uh, for a 4.5 to be inserted on hydrogen TMDL monitoring. Right. And I don't know if that's a... Um, an element because it's it's kind of tied in with this, and uh, if we're talking about in the in the title we have TMDL um, compliance, so if we have TMDL compliance, maybe there should be something, uh, some wording in there, some language about monitoring of t the, t the nitrogen TMDL. Okay, the working group looked at that. <coughs> yes, and I think I think that the, the thought is Ron that. We're not, this is not watershed monitoring. This is the, a program to monitor individual IAs. So that that's not appropriate. Uh, okay, well then, but, right, but the, the first words in the title are what? Watershed. Just read them out. Watershed nitrogen <laughs> TMDL compliance. That's the first wording. I, I think you're both right. I, I think that John is right about the general philosophy of it, and Ron has got a point about the title. We should change I think the, title. the fix is to change the title. Yeah. Change the title. I agree. It's a good okay, point. So what do we call it? <clears throat> the other thing is we have a program for monitoring the Sentinel stations Already. that is completely outside right. of the responsible ma management entity <sighs> and completely outside of the specific technologies, like the wastewater treatment facility has a monitoring program for its performance that is a separate document even, if you will, <clears throat> than water quality monitoring for Sentinel stations and TMDL compl compliance. So what if you change the title to Community Quality Control of Enhanced IA? How about just Enhanced IA Monitoring Program? I mean, management. What it is, or management and Monitoring Program. That's true. That's what this that's is. That's what it is. Yeah. That's so just okay that solves several problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It so eliminates the defining TMDL in the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think okay. we all do tend to okay. skip over okay. the title when we're looking at these documents. Yeah, we're looking for the meat. Dig right in. <laughs> and yeah. Enhanced IAs. Are we all on board with this one? I think. Monitoring but program. Management, management and monitoring program. Yeah, that's good. And while we're on the monitoring and, and the record keeping section, we're um, not. We're on the title. Oh right, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Enhanced. You a, a stake through the heart of that. All right, well, I'm just. I, I have to. I mean, I'm. I'm trying to edit something while you guys are talking, so I need to just. Right. All right. So enhanced IA com colon or parentheses, innovative alternative nitrogen reducing septic systems, and parentheses, management and monitoring program. Mm. Okay. Fine. Next. 
for the, for the benefit of the press, this, this is about as interesting as watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> but we have something more interesting coming when Ken Foreman arrives. <laughs> and he's not here yet, so. <laughs> we're, so we're, we're dragging this out. We're no, we don't need to do, what was your next? And, and she realizes this is part of the sausage making. Yes, yes and right. And we're not going to see it in the paper next week. <laughs> <laughs> and we've all so, watched um, of paint dry. <laughs> another detailed point on, on point uh, C uh -huh. under record keeping. The, the monitored results for total nitrogen are within the system effluent? Yes. Okay, so that maybe should be spelled out there, monitoring. Uh, well, I think it's results. implied that we're monitoring the systems. I mean, don't we say that? Well, it says records will be kept for each property. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'm just trying to pin it down as tightly I think the more you look at it, the more oh, crazy yeah. you're making yourself. I, 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 honestly. You're <laughs> insightful. <laughs> <laughs> True, okay. Do we have any other substantive uh, observations or corrections that we'd like to propose? I have one, mm -hmm. one, what, what? One, one lesser thing, which I will leave to the scientists among us. Uh, leader is usually lowercase. It's not capital L, it's usually lowercase L, usually. The most, everything, all the publications I've had it's always been lowercase. So I looked that up. And Total nitrogen per oh. liter. Oh. The L was capitalized. Um, yeah, I just I looked mean, where, I, where I, I looked it all up. My, yeah, anyway. But um, actually, it's usually TM L to the minus one. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that's the way it depends. But, but no, in this case, it's, you know, the, the more common, but L, I never, I, it's, doesn't matter. We have TMDL, capital L means load. In this case, right. it's, it's liter. So, so you want a small L instead of a large L? Well, that that, was what, that's not how, that's not, no, that's no, not right. It's a capital L. It's, it's a easy. capital L. Yeah. All right, leave it there. Okay. Well, okay. And there's no ambiguity with any, there's less ambiguity with a large L. They use uppercase L in the, in the state reports. So okay. I right. want to be okay. consistent. Okay. That's right. 10 I milligrams per load. Yeah, no, I, I, I did. I spent yeah, some time okay. looking it up. <laughs> and I've looked it up before because it's small mg in capital L, which makes no sense, but that's the way it's, yeah. it's okay. done. Yeah, okay, whatever. Those leaders are getting And I'm not doing minus ones because you change the font and it goes away. Yeah. No, that, that, was, that was the one okay. editorial, that was the one Ken is uh, here. technical comment Ken I had in a publication. Yeah. All right. I had a slash L oh, no. and they said, it should be L to the minus one. Please make the change. Yeah, so this is, so we took Thank one vote. Thank you here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ken. You saved us, Ken. Can we stop? Talk from what? Talk Talk from what? Talk Talk from what? Ourselves. Ourselves. Yeah. Ourselves. So that was going through Matt's comments on my grant application. All right. So we think we have a okay. final document as of May 17th. Yes. 18th. 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 That's yes. right. All right. Yeah, clearly, nothing is final in this world, but this is yes. final for now. So. All right. Do you have a thumb drive? Is yeah. this what we're sending then? This is where, which will well, carry on sure to the next step. Yeah. Um, so this will be sent to DEP? Well, yes, no. To, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then we should, should we vote on the document then? Should I make a motion that um, this is the, as we call it, because there's going to be changes beyond, so okay. well, we know that at some point in the process. Well, all right, whatever you see. Okay. Yeah. But it's your intent to take it up to yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll whoever. Take, take it up to the next step. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're not taking a vote, but what do we want to say in the minutes? Um, this version. Uh, say anything. Is ready for additional review. Wider circulation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Sediment aeration presentation by Ken Foreman. Tell, are you close to ready? Yeah. 30 seconds. All right. Want to do the minutes? Okay. Want to do the minutes? Does everybody sure. see the minutes? Any yes. additions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, I'll take a motion to adopt the minutes. So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, further discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I'll aye. Yes. abstain because I wasn't here. Fair enough. Oh, you guys are too efficient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any reports of members and staff uh, that will go on for 30 seconds or less? <laughs> uh, we have meetings scheduled for 
June 1st and June 15th. Oh. Uh, do we want to talk about the time yeah. for those meetings? Well, I, I have a, a fellow who's going to agree to come on June 15th, the EPA's expert on eelgrass. Uh, Great. Is going gonna, is gonna to come and uh, give us a presentation. He spent a lot of time in West Falmouth this summer and has some good news to report about the eelgrass in West Falmouth. Nice. Uh, but, but he's done eelgrass all up and down the northeast uh, coast. So he's well, uh, uh, don't, don't ask me to know. It's some, somebody at EPA. So, did you discuss a time with him other than just the yeah, day? Well, yeah, I told him 3.30 is when we usually meet. Oh, okay. So, but I, he could, well, 8.30 would be tough because he lives in the Boston area. Yes. Uh, so, if it's 3.30 all right for people on the 15th of June? Mm -hmm. Okay, for me. Yes. 15th's okay. Mm -hmm. First wouldn't work for me. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, let's talk about the first. Uh, it sounds like 8.30 well, would be better. What would be good for you on the first? I, I won't be on the first. Oh, but, okay. yeah, so no time. Anytime. There's Skype, Ron. <laughs> no, you can't do right. that. Yeah. Not in Falmouth. Not in Falmouth. It has, you, you cannot attend a meeting. Oh, right. Yeah, oh. you have to physically be present. You have to physically yeah. be present. Oh, okay. Was there any thought about the first, whether it should be 8.30 or? I have no preference. No preference? No. Okay, well, three thirty. Three thirty. Have it at the regular time. It's better okay. for the enterprise. <laughs> yes. Three thirty on the first. Yes. On the first. And it keeps us consistent as long yes. as. And yes. then we'll the discuss. The reporter isn't up at eight thirty. <laughs> She's up till one o'clock in the morning writing things. Not usually. All right. So we have a meeting schedule for the. Fr I just need to book the room and the right. time, so it's right. very helpful yeah. to just right. have that for the month. Okay. See, seeing as I missed the aquaculture meeting last night, okay. Sia, do you want to just tell us? Yes, sure. Um, a great meeting. The plan has been adopted in draft form. There is one change that's going to occur, and that is to not include the specifics of any kind of surcharges as part of it because we realized there are a number of unknowns. We don't know if we're going to get a grant that's going to pay for the permitting. We don't know if we're going to get a grant that will pay for people for the first uh, few years of implementation. We don't really know exactly how many cohogs you can grow as an in-kind contribution. And what the division usually does is, you know, crawl, walk, run. So the idea that we would come up with any kind of a contribution from the growers happening during the piloting phase made a lot more sense. So instead of codifying a, an amount or even a straw man in the plan, we're just going to write a paragraph about general uh, principle, a general principle of looking at this moving forward and, and when those decisions would be made. On the other hand, before you grant one of these rotational licenses, growers need to have a sense of the finances of what may or may not be required of them. So we're going to have that stated in the report without a, re a number associated to it. So the next steps are a public meeting that has been tentatively scheduled but is not final and I'm not going to give you the date because we have to confirm the Herman meeting room for it. So once that has been confirmed, we'll have a date for the public uh, meeting on this. And then the working group will meet one more time after that public meeting to synthesize the comments that come from that meeting and then the plan is to get to the board of selectmen um, after that so this is all planned for june so june we'll have a public mm -hmm. hearing the last working group meeting and then a board of selectmen presentation in the month so wow progress is made Perfect. good john uh, ron was there too so you no, i was just going to say that on that point about charges and things i mean a lot of it is oriented toward the budget for the Department of Marine Environmental Services, right? But as we're looking at, as this committee has been looking at shellfish as a nitrogen attenuation mechanism, shellfish aquaculture, um, that it may be that if, let's take for example, if uh, Bourne's Pond, if Bourne's Pond works out that the inlet widening reduces the nitrogen load by 2,000 kilograms of the 4,000 that needs to be done, aquaculture might reduce the other 2,000 or some portion of it. We don't know what exactly at this point. So if that's the case, then there's a benefit, not just to DMES, but to 
uh, public works in general in terms of the cost for uh, alternatives and sewering and other things. So it may not be warranted necessarily to have a surcharge for on the aquaculture for the production because it's the savings to the town on another side. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to looking at it as an enterprise account, we look at it as a town ben general ben financial benefit to the town perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a good thing that this whole surcharge mm -hmm. aspect is reconsidered. Another dimension to that too is that this is something that needs to be explored. And as as, uh, as C has said, you, first you crawl, but then you don't walk. You necessarily take baby steps and then you walk, kind of. But is that the um, uh, the notion could be that the uh, there could be two different types of grants. One would be a standard grant, which is so much like twenty-five dollars an acre or whatever it is to do it. There could be another grant that would be that plus a a, a charge for uh, seed oysters which would be much more. So the town would be basically providing those to the grower, and then the grower really has control over, they're not paying to seed quahog someplace. Mm -hmm. They'd be, have a self, an interest in getting these, these seed animals from the town. So this is, these are all a lot of different factors that need, still need to be, and it'd probably be different anyway in the end, but you know, but things, you know, moving ahead. So I think it's good that this notion is is put in very general terms at this point and then uh, worked out as we move forward right. and just to add to that just before you add, on yeah. the same point um the town is committed to wanting to bring this to the next steps so that's very very exciting that that implementation phase is actually in view and and terrific encouraged Steve. um you call this the uh, Aquaculture group, right? We're working Shellfish group. working group. Shellfish working group. Um, despite the fact that this is a great thing, and I'm all in favor of it, and all these people know each other and all all friendly, are they cognizant of the fact that there's an intrinsic adversarial relationship between vendors and purchase between the town and the people in the business of growing shellfish? I, I mean, I there's a kind of rent sinking. I don't mean that they're mad at each other. I'm just saying, from a business standpoint, when there are payments involved, it's a zero-sum game by definition. In other words, when any entity well. saves money, somebody else loses rent, rent revenue. We've been I mean, watching that in practice. Aware of that. We've been watching in practice. I bet they are. Um, and, and just on, on Ron's point, and then we'll get on to Ken. Yep. Um, the, I think the issue that is going to be part of this general goal statement is if the Marine and Environmental Services Department is going to be doing all this propagation and cohogs are part of the benefit of rotational licenses, their budget has to be increased. Right. And, and that's part of what's important to not just not give them money but also, you know, not have fees right. but have a way for their budgets to go up so that we can buy these seed. End okay. of story. Thank you. Uh, Ron, I'm sorry, not Ron. Now yeah. it's Ken. Uh, for everybody's for everybody's recollection, the the, the uh, sediment aeration is something that we've looked at as a possible way of dealing with the nitrogen. We actually commissioned commissioned a study of it, and this is the report of that study from last summer's test. Okay, you want me up there? Wherever you want to be. Doesn't matter. Yeah, well, no, the the, yeah, you, need mic. Mic. you need a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there's a clicker somewhere, too. Oh, is there? Yeah, it might be on right the podium. Next, right under the podium. Just check the podium, okay. yeah. The mic can bring it back. Yeah, you, can, you can use, just take it off. Yeah, I think, I think it is. Take that just, mic Just off, take off the mic and drag it over to the thing and click. So there's, yeah. Well, if this works. There's a pointer in there also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah where, where works for you? Uh, Okay, good. Uh, all right, so uh, this is an experiment that uh, we did with uh, you know, the help of Science Wares last summer and also an intern from uh, University of Richmond who uh, was funded by University of Richmond to help us out. And the idea was to deploy a a set of aerators in this treatment area uh, and then have a control area which we designated down here and 
monitor the oxygen conditions uh, as that treatment proceeded through the summer. Uh, the thinking behind this is that there's quite a bit of uh, internal recycling and or internal loading, if you will, of nitrogen from organic matter that's been stored up over the years as this system has eutrophied within the sediments. That's going to uh, release ammonia into the overlying water. Uh, if we could create aerobic conditions, we might be able to promote denitrification through nit coupled nitrification, denitrification, and also promote the decomposition of the organic matter stored in those sediments and uh, accelerate uh, recovery once the external load is controlled. So uh, to look at oxygen conditions, we deployed uh, some a, uh, a hydrolab sond that measures temperature, salinity, uh, oxygen, uh, and uh, photosynthetically active radiation in uh, entering the water column uh, in this site and then in the control site. Now let's see if I can figure out how to advance here. And what you, what you see here is, is just basically the, uh, a survey that was also done at the same time uh, for depth. Uh, these intervals go, this is a one foot to six feet. So this is quite a shallow system as is typical for, for these ponds. What okay. do the yellow arrows indicate? The yellow arrow, TCMO. Oh, uh, that was current? Those, those are the current. Those are the current. Uh, current. Oh, Temperate. tilt current meters. Yes. Right. Those are the little low old tilt current meters. Uh, I'm not going to show you any of that data, but there was considerable current, north-south current in yeah. here, driven by tides. And of course, there is a prevailing, in the summer, prevailing wind from the south. Do now, you want me to advance for you? Well, let, let's just see if this works. You probably have to point it toward the... Try pointing it to the computer. Oops. Well, that stops it. Yeah, maybe you should advance. Yeah. <coughs> I like the pointer. <laughs> see if you can get it back. <laughs> yeah, see if we can. Back to square one. <laughs> or just use this little paintbrush guy down here. Just use this, yeah. All right, so next slide. So next slide shows, shows the, a little more detail on the deployment. Um, there's a bunch of little diffusers here, and if, if you click one more time, we'll see what they sort of look like. Mm. So looking through the water column, you can <laughs> see bubbles here. So there was a, a, a comparatively small area that was affected by each of these, and that really turned out to be the Achilles heel of this experiment, mm -hmm. uh, because these systems have been used in deeper, in deeper ponds, and when they're used in deeper ponds, you have this release of bubbles that's coming up through the water column as it's coming up, you know, pressure is released, the whole plume of bubbles expands, the bubbles themselves expand, they entrain more water, and they create a much more turbulent kind of mixing than we could achieve uh, in this, you know, basically two meter water column. But uh, I think we deployed one, two, three, four, array of eight of these, um, there's uh, a manifold here that distributes the air and a big compressor on shore that's driven uh, so electron, you know, through power that we were able to get from Belmouthport. Yeah, and Belmouthport has been very supportive and allowed all of this. All right, so thank you very much, Belmouthport. Can, can I interrupt for a minute here? These are about 30 centimeters square, if I remember. Uh, yeah, about a meter, yeah. No, foot. The, the diffusers foot. are a foot. Yeah, 30 well, centimeters. Yeah, 30 centimeters. Right, okay, but there, yeah. and then what, uh, there's a baffle on top. Right, I saw the pictures of the... Yep. And that, that I'm going to guess that's a meter on a side. Yeah. Uh, oh, so each one has a baffle. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah, and that was a, a not post... Just the one so we, right, initially the baffles weren't there, then we added the baffles too because it was apparent that we weren't having a, a big enough effect. So part of the hope might be that if there's prevailing current, you know, you could set up a wall of these things and maybe get a, a plume of oxygenated water that's carried in one direction or another. But this was our first attempt, so we didn't, you know, that wasn't how it was arranged for this. Um, so if you go to the next slide, just to show you a very dynamic system, um, this is photosynthetically active radiation over a period of three days. So we have daytime, nighttime. 
and oxygen saturation goes from, you know, uh, here 100 percent up to almost 250 percent during the day, and then at night you have all the sediment respiration going on, and again next day. Now superimposed on this is the fact, oops, go back, is the fact that the, wa you know, the water column, uh, the water is changing. You've got either, depending on the tide, you've got river water coming across here carrying cooler, fresher water that may have different oxygen uh, conditions or uh, warmer, saltier water from, um, so, but we do get a pretty clear diel signal. Um, Okay, and then the next slide is just a showing a multi-day comparison between our aerated uh, site and our and uh, control. control site. And <laughs> uh, as you can see, we didn't achieve a real significant uh, difference in uh, oxygen conditions. How far was the measurement from the closest baffle? So uh, if you, that, that you, you could go, let's see, go back a slide, I think, maybe, or two slides. Two slides, yeah. yeah so I think our, we tried to place our sonde right in the center of the array, you know. We were hoping for a kind of a big effect that would be, I mean, we, however, that's a great question. So the next thing that we did was to go out to the arrays and measure right at the array, a meter from the array and three meters from the array, vertical profiles of temperature, salinity, and oxygen. And again, you can see this strong stratification here in uh, temperature. Warm at the surface, cooler at depth, even though this system is, you know, just a little more than a meter deep. Uh, so we have all this fresh water that's coming down from the, you know, the river uh, into the uh, into Great Pond. And then similarly, you can see that here with the salinity. So we have temperature and salinity uh, remind you that uh, fresher, warmer water um, is denser, and the salinity here you dominates. It's so less dense. Uh, I'm sorry, less, uh, less dense. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and uh, so right at the array, we do disrupt that stratification. But, you know, if you go a meter away, yeah. the, uh, the impact is lost. So that's also reflected uh, a little bit in this next slide, which is, shows the pattern profile for oxygen. And you can see a uh, little effect here at the surface uh, versus the pattern uh, away from the array. If you were doing this in a deeper water situation, do you think it would be a different I think result? it would be more effective okay. because you just have to imagine these bubbles which start out as little micro bubbles, you know, if they're at one and, you know, 1.3 atmospheres at depth and then they're going to come up through the, uh, through the surface and, you know, bubbles will expand and they'll entrain water uh, as they come up and further mix the system. I, you know, I just have, in looking at this, I mean, the, the fact that you're not seeing much difference is kind of a, at least at this stage, is, is, is indicative that it's, it's not working as, as, it, as it might have been expected. But more importantly, I think, you know, when you look at the dynamics of Great Pond and you look at the freshwater inflows to it, which vary somewhat year to year, month to month even, but based on the uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Estuary Project study, there's basically like a, a, a volume change based on fresh water coming in once per month. Okay, so from groundwater precipitation and uh, uh, the Cunemesset River coming down. So the question I have with this after spending umpteen years and hours of trying to manage sediments and aquaculture systems that you tend to get, if you, if, you, if you tend to get it to come up, it will settle somewhere else, okay? So that spot that you're working in, it may be transported. The extra oxygen coming in would help with respiration and reduction to some extent of the mass by carbon release in CO2. But the thing is, is that if, if that happens, then you're not really doing much overall to the system because it's just moving around. That's one point. 
the second point is is that it's possible, although I don't know if if you've got any uh, information on this, that the aeration process itself may cause the microalgae, the phytoplankton, to flocculate and settle from the physical disturbance. This would mean that that flow out once per month of a volume of microalgae going into the sound may be actually captured in Great Pond as more sediment. I'm just wondering if that is some a dimension that you considered. Well, we, we certainly didn't make any measurements of sedimentation yeah. or changes in particulate material. Um, the idea here was not to stir up the sediments. So these, these uh, aerators were placed a little bit above the, the sediment surface. So it was to, to mix the water column and try to keep things oxygenated. Uh, if they're oxygenated, we can have coupled nitrification, denitrification. If it's anoxic at the bottom, we're not going to get that. So that was really the idea behind this. Uh, <coughs> And in addition, if we can have aerobic uh, decomposition, we're going to more efficiently get rid of the carbon that's stored in the sediments. Um, yep, Steve. Um, what's interesting to me about this graph is that since you get a little bit, I mean, the, the previous graph make you think, gee, if you had a different way of emitting the bubbles, more diffusers or hoses, maybe you could do something. But then this one shows that even when you're right there, zero meters away, yeah, uh, above 0.6 meters down, it's not bringing up the oxygenated so, water. So we it's have somehow getting diluted. Well, so so this graph. Couple things about this graph. It re these profiles, depending on, and I probably didn't choose the best one. There's a lot of them that I could have chosen. Um, first of all, it shows higher oxygen conditions at depth. So what's going on? Why is that? Because that's not what you, you, you would expect, right? But if you, there's so much uh, benthic microalgae uh, that if you go out there at, you know, three in the afternoon and make this measurement or six, even six in the mm -hmm. evening, uh, remembering this is summer, um, you're going to see higher oxygen at depth and you're going to approach atmospheric at the surface. If you go out there at 6 in the morning, you're going to see a profile that looks almost the opposite. Um, the point here was w what we would really like to have is so almost a uniform, uh, right. you know, straight, straight line for the, for the s mixed systems and just to say that here we have strong, still evidence of strong stratification. We weren't able to mix this water column with the bubbles. It, that's what I'm saying. That regardless of what is at the bottom, this isn't bringing it up to the top. It, it, in this figure, it, it's, there's a little evidence of some stirring of some kind, but not much. It, yeah. It, it's, it, all, yeah. It's also likely that the, the DO concentration will peak around 3 p.m. usually in the summer months. Yeah, it's that's right. Time. So I'm wondering, did you do, do you have a graph at like at 4 in the morning? You know, when we don't have one at four in the morning. We do have some at <laughs> six in the morning. Six. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, well, you know, Ron, right? if you would like to go out at four, we're happy to no, have no, you go. No, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> before, actually, yeah, the minimal, the minimal, where the oxygen is. You're right. You're lowest. absolutely right. Yeah. yeah you're absolutely. And I should have. I, I will admit to you guys yeah. that this was a rush job. <laughs> <laughs> And I should have picked a better graph. Uh, but I, I, we have this type of data. We collected lots of data like this. Uh, and uh, perhaps not lots, but. Right. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we did one other experiment that I think sh suggests that there is promise to this. And that is we collected some sediments early on and incubated them under two conditions for uh, so somewhere on the order of two to three weeks. Uh, one was aerated, so we just kept the overlying water in the sediment cores, and there were, I think, three replicate cores involved here. Uh, aerated, and three that were kept sealed. And then after that, we changed out the overlying water and measured the flux of uh, ammonia, out and the uh, uptake of oxygen. And so for the aerated 
cores, and remember these were all taken from the same site, uh, we, we had about uh, half as much um, oxygen uptake and about half as much ammonia release as for those uh, sealed cores that were kept anaerobic um, over that time. So the, the, the suggestion here is that if we could achieve uh, mixing throughout the water column, we could probably achieve some improvements to sediment quality. Um, and it's just over time. And it's just a question of could we reconfigure these arrays in a way that might better yield mixing? And uh, so, you know, there's a couple of thoughts about how we might do that. One, as I mentioned, is to sort of create a fence, if you will, uh, so that we could get a plume of oxygenated water that's carried in the tide. Because there is a considerable current here, um, as the tilt, tilt meter data showed. Uh, directional flows and uh, so if, if we could get those kind of wafting back and forth over the over the sediments uh, that might might help and then uh, working a little more with how to disperse these flows as they come out of the bubblers. Would you try it in a deeper location? Well if we could figure out a deeper location but this is a shallow pond. So while being in a deeper estuary might have this existing mm -hmm. system work better, solving the problem for shallow yeah. estuaries is what we want to do. Right. Yeah. So right. the question is to ha you know what yeah. to do now that we've learned so much about this, what happens in these shallow systems? Yeah. How well, to get? Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't take you if you had a different configuration and ignore the time to create the different configuration for a second. It wouldn't take long to see if it was working better, right? I mean, you could see in a no. day if it was working better. No, the hard part is, you know, it's it's not a minor thing to set these things up. Well, but what? Uh, that's, and, that's and, and there the is other part. other data that we, uh, you know, quite a bit of other data that's in the report, that uh, including some surveys where we went up and down the estuary in a boat and took, uh, you know sort of continuous <coughs> oxygen measurements to map out the oxygen distributions uh, and so forth. Um, but, but the second half of what I was going to say is that the thing you could do that doesn't require much extra setup, except I guess the stuff's all been down for the winter and now you have to take it out there again, but, right. but is to just put all your diffusers right next to each other to see yeah. if there's some critical mass. I mean, basically that, I believe, is, <coughs> is what, you know, I mean, Eric, uh, Karpolis, who of course is the engineer on this project, uh, is thinking. Am I correct in that? Yes. Do you have any insights? Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> the idea is we learned a lot about the site and about the stratification and the dynamics of this location. It's shallow, which makes it similar to other estuary systems, so it's worth sort of cracking the nut from an engineering perspective. Mm. And what um, we've talked about is uh, a, a, a no-cost extension to the project, so not asking for any more money, but for uh, permission, if you will, to go ahead and and tr continue to experiment mm -hmm. at the site. <coughs> not so we don't lose a whole summer of right. work, but we have the diffusers. We change the ah, configuration. Go. You got it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you go. That didn't you know, increase the. Density and really just, I think the goal is going to be to try to break stratification. Yeah. That's sort of the. You both keep talking about promoting mixing, but do you have an idea of the relative importance of just adding oxygen from the aeration itself versus the. Or I don't have a good sense of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think they both, you know, obviously if we, if we could, uh, the, the direct uh, diffusion from the bubbles we create to oxygenate the water column um, is going to be helpful. Uh, but I don't think we have like a quantified way of... Because if it's just about mixing, there's, there's probably other ways to promote yeah. mixing mm -hmm. than That's aeration. Right. right. Well, we do. We, we, what we want to do is mix this oxygenated water. That's yeah. what we want to do. Yeah. So you're 
adding oxygen to the water, making sure that water can be added the oxygen too, is getting. But I think what he's saying is if you already have oxygenated water at the top and you just mix it. Depending on the time of day, you do or you don't. Right. You know, if you go out, as Ron, as Ron said, if you go out at 6 in the morning or 4 in the morning, yeah. you do not have oxygenated water. Yeah. In the middle of the night, you do not have oxygen. So this thing bubbles all the time. So the idea would be that it would create oxygenated conditions throughout the water column day and night. But, but what if, you, if, but you're saying during the day, the surface water is oxygenated? Yeah, because there's a lot of photosynthesis. So if you just mix that, but yes, you wouldn't be doing anything at night. Right. But it might be working during the day, as opposed right. to this that isn't working day or night. Well, no, during the day, we had oxygen <coughs> at the bottom. During the day, we did. did it, so because did of it. photosynthesis, not right. because of mixing. Right. right. So but the point is to create <coughs> continuous oxygenation throughout the water column. Yeah. And Steve's point oh. is really good, that the other thing we thought to look at this particular season is the timing. And to have dissolved oxygen, maybe doing more mixing at night. Not right. I mean, it's the nighttime is the, is the really the key mm -hmm. that's thing the here. That's when stuff dies and turns into moths. Interesting. So, so Ken, so have, have non-tidal fluxes been measured in the pond? Non-tidal in, in other words, net movement of water. Oh, of, of uh, I think there's stuff in the MEP report about the, uh, you know, the volume. And is there any evidence of layered flow, in other words, upstream at depth? I mean, this is so shallow, but it's also so stratified that, you know, the classic estuarine model is deeper water these flowing things look, up, uphill. These things look a little bit like That's classic estuaries. That's what getting at here. Yeah. Maybe you could go to the deeper hole and at What night, deeper hole? Well, the downstream, <laughs> I'm calling it a hole, it's a, yeah. a basin. It's a yeah. two-meter basin. Right. Oh, and, I see what you're saying. And yeah. you may be able to oxygenate so, so that and then assume, yeah. if, it's, if it's working like some of the models do, that it might flow upstream. We do, we do get into a practical issue at some point. First of all, we, in order to create this array, Yeah. Geography. The power. We, we power. need to. We need power. Yes. We need oh, to. I know. We I need know. to get. <laughs> we need to get the air out to the hole through. You know, and we have to worry about boats. We could put such uh, an array of PV boat traffic cells that we'd shake you know. the estuary. Three <laughs> feet. <laughs> you have to worry about boats. We we the the arrays themselves are. You know, the, the little bubblers come up off the bottom a little bit. So if you're you, you put them, but we weren't worried that boats. Not boats where we were, no. but if we were in a busy section right. of the yeah. harbor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, right, right. yeah, just one other thing. I mean, if in terms of the mixing that, that uh, Matt raised, you know, I, I don't know if solar bees have been used in estuaries very much or at all. There's one in that's, 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 But that's yeah, in but that fresh water water. pond. Freshwater pond. Fresh water. <laughs> so I don't know how that would compare, but I'm still concerned about the increased sedimentation it may be caused by this yeah. activity. Yeah. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's just, it, it, I know that physical stirring uh, c can perturb systems and that you can get flocculation and then settling. And, well, there's, uh, you know, remember, there's, yeah. there's, there is some physical stirring just from all the boats going around in these systems. And uh, the wind. And the wind. Mm. I don't think. Yeah, this I, is very I, intensive. I don't, all I don't, the time. Mm. But yeah. it's not designed to, to actually, in, it, it doesn't kick up the bottom. No doesn't have to kick up the bottom. It's the, the phytoplankton in the water column that when it's yep. perturbed, it can flocculate and it can then settle. But in, in the summertime, mm -hmm. most of the production is happening at the sediment water interface. Right? That's, probably the, yeah, that's probably the case. Like yeah. It that's far exceeds what's yeah. happening in well, the water That's what all the food in the water. And you saw that in the oxygen right. data. So, I mean, I think the, the bottom line is we're, we're hoping we can, you know, play with it a little more over the summer, uh, see if uh, we can configure the array to get a broader effect, and then hopefully that would result in some improvements that would, trans, you know, in, in the actual sediment qualities. That's the, the key. Question is whether if you, you know, if you were able to achieve this, would it result in more rapid recovery from the sediments. The core experiments we did suggested that uh, may, maybe that would, uh, would work. What, yeah. do you need, what do you need from us? You have a CONCOM permit. Presumably it, it lets you go this summer too? Yep. 
Yeah, the conservation permit is a negative determination on the oh, RDA, fine. so right. we're allowed. So, what, do you need anything from us? So, I don't. Um, your blessing. blessing. Yeah, I think <laughs> just your blessing is, okay. is good. And, you know, so maybe the Falmouth Board people are on board yep. if we yeah. want to yeah. keep going. Okay. So, we just felt we, we should give you some idea of what we, what we did so far. No, your report was terrific. Uh, not, the results, maybe not so much, but, but the report right. was really uh, wonderful. Right, and you can see, you know, what's amazing about these systems is just how, how dynamic the oxygen mm -hmm. conditions are within them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're highly productive, and they have a lot of respiration going on too. So, just as, uh, do you look at pH also? Yeah, it measures pH too. Oh, good. I Remember, just these are uh, I know, but fairly the, the, strongly buffered because uh, of the salinity. The, oh, they are okay. So you don't get much fluctuation. You well. get some some fluctuation, but it's not huge. Did, did you have any independent measure that mixing was actually, that the bubbles were actually in training water? I mean, I suppose we could try to do a dye study or something, release a little dye at depth, see how it disperses. It might be different, you know, it's different bubble sizes, it might. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the things that, you know, <coughs> to some degree we could try to play with, although the diffusers are... I don't know how much flexibility there is on the diffusers. If you wanted to come up with different bubbles. Different, just, just different size bubbles. Soaker, not the get size the soaker hoses, the local hardware well, store. No, the, so that's the, something that we've thought about is actually originally the idea was to not use these already fabricated right. diffusers and use um, gas permeable hose. Not soaker hoses, but really a much yeah. more micro, you know, almost a nano bubble mm -hmm. approach. Um, but we. Um, I'm saying make sure that nano bubble isn't worse than big bubble. We're sure that smaller bubbles are going to yeah, diffuse. I, I mean, the diffusion rate of oxygen in. No, I mean for in training the water. For water movement. From so water movement, uh, convection of the water. For you. I think that's a pressure question, and the size of the bubble probably doesn't matter either. What I'm saying is that. How so much one does thing, the whole Eric. Cost and how much does a soaker hose cost? But one and thing Eric considered, no, that I thought was a cl <coughs> would be clever would be sort of almost like a propeller-based system, right? And that that's what the solar bees. That's the solar bees. Yeah. Yeah. bees are. Yeah. But so so solar bees are mixers, 100% mixers. They take the yeah. surface. And right. The purpose, <coughs> the the Tucci system. You know, this is a Tucci. Um, now I can't remember, Lake Savers, right. specially patented, blah, 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 diffusion system. And their claim to fame is creating these micro bubbles that diffuse into the water. So it's adding oxygen, right. not just mixing the oxygen that's in the surface waters. Right. And Pour so it, that right. was the purpose at some level of this pilot study was to evaluate this tech, this this vendor's solution that was not just mixing. Right. So, you know, part of it is to take a step back and say, but yeah, you know, I, and, and that, was that was perfectly the, reasonable, the, but it didn't work. So, the, right, so the, right. ways of doing yeah. it. So the next question, I think one of the, go ahead. The, I'm just his the diffuser that he then added on top. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Is that a rotating diffuser? No. So it's a baffle. Right. Yeah. So if that were you know, if we could use the bubbles themselves to drive it as a, no, to, it's to rotate. No, it's yeah, but then I think, I think the issue is, is what's, what's the forcing function here? Is it diffusion or is it convection? Right. And it's my guess is convection is going to do the trick in most circumstances, partly because the lifting ability of these nano bubbles is minor. Sure, they grow as they rise and pressure decreases, but yeah. right. I, I well, maybe we could use a mix. I, I just don't know. I, so, so, maybe we could use a mix. Compared to these, I would guess. I mean, nope. the, the point is, there's yeah, there there might be some different configurations that we could. Play the question with. is, is simple mixing more valuable? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I think I'm thinking the convective model would be better that would be overall. A good, then that would be a on, good on a larger scale within the estuary. I think. The well, I think we need to add oxygen. If we want to get these things oxygenated at night, we need to mm -hmm. add right. oxygen. So. There's also a possibility, although it may not be as efficient, is uh, airlift pumps that could then direct the flow out of them, and you might be able to create some kind of a 
motion with with them all oriented in the same direction in an area you know right you, right well that is you know, sort of the, the, the goal is to create a directional <laughs> plume that yeah. but um, you know combining something like a convective yeah, yeah but uh, uh, you got solar B approach with the bubbling you've got the whole surface of the estuary as, as a diffusive membrane with spectacular amounts of oxygen except for the except uh, for night. wait let me see well, and then but when you're convecting you would continuously change that gradient. And, and it, I've got to think somebody sat down and, and modeled how much oxygen you can pull across there at night if you had a couple of convective cells. I, I, think, yeah. I bet you could move a lot of oxygen into the water column just because the gradient is so steep. And again, at night, it's going to be very steep. You know, you've got a jillion parts per million of oxygen overhead. I have a thought. Should we have a working group? Should we create? I, think, I mean, it'd be great, but you know, we really could benefit from physicist. Yes. We don't have a physicist on this committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. Eric's a physicist. I took physics. <laughs> <laughs> I took <like> physics. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just thinking about, I mean, these are some really good the energy to mix and, these, yeah. to, to mix these salt stratified systems is high. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just have, get a couple of people that are interested, you know, yeah, getting yeah, Ron yeah. and I, Tom. So and so I'm not sure you need a physicist. I, I think yes. Tom has a reasonable idea. Right. The existing thing doesn't work, so you, the question is you make a list and prioritize it of other things that might work. And, and you the, decide what to do this bubblers summer. that are sold commercially to keep boats yeah. from being caught in the ice yeah. mm -hmm. use bigger bubbles. And they yep. clearly and that's convect pure, enough to keep model. the temperature yeah. the right. Yeah. But, yep. Yeah. But uh, all I'm saying, Steve, is you, just because you're using bigger bubbles doesn't mean you still can't use small bubbles, too. I think we, should ha we need a combined approach. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of energy, in your next report, make sure to tell us the estimated cost per kilogram <laughs> removed <laughs> of this technology. Right, right. Once, Once we it get works. That, we need that from Once we get, that. get it to work. Yeah, yeah. let's show that it, let's show it could work, and then we'll work on the cost. Right. <coughs> okay. Any, any other questions or comments for Ken? Uh, just I think you should start looking at the costs now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just what you know today, get an idea. I know to see if it'll work, but if it did work, how well would it work is the point from a cost-benefit yeah. ratio. So, yeah. That might require additional funding. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, it depends. It sounds like a little in-house uh, promotion there. So. Well, let me thank you for the report. Okay. And, and thank you for everything else you've done for this town and, and continue yeah. to do. Every time we turn around, Ken Foreman is doing something use, <laughs> useful, useful for this town and, and, does, and doesn't charge us for it. So we appreciate it. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> You're having too much fun, Ken. <laughs> All right. Last item on the agenda is uh, these draft TMDLs for Wild Harbor, Quisset Harbor, and Fiddler's Cove Ranch Canal. Uh, DEP has put out. Uh, as Bob Murray used to say, they're, we're halfway to China, and they're just getting out of bed. Yeah. Uh, this, this is not news that the uh, TMDLs for these water bodies have been established by the MEP report. Um, the state seems to have its own process for looking at the MEP report and, can, and, and letting the public know what's in them and, and all of that. I think we've probably done a good deal of that already, but they're going to do it their way. So they've sent these, their own sort of conclusions about the TMDLs on those water bodies, and unless their TMDL numbers are substantially different from the MEP ones, I, I don't think it's going to affect our work in any way. Uh, are they substantially different? From, I, I, from the MEP reports, the current, the numbers that the state reports. They are not different. The one, different. I, did a, I, I did a review but of these and the, I think the, give us a quick summary. Quick, quick summary is if you look at the MEP report tables of nitrogen removal requirements to achieve TMDL compliance and what the TMDL documents have, they're the same, you know, as a breath of fresh air. So that was good. They add and subtract a few calculations. So the TMDL is, a, is not written in the MEP report. The removal load oh. is written in the right. MEP report. And the removal loads on which this TMDL is based are the same. The difference is the, M the TMDL document looks at um, atmospheric deposition and benthic flux, 
uh, as the total load that then is allowable to achieve the TMDL. So the, the total maximum daily load is what the estuary can take. The removal load is what we have to get rid of to get to that total loading rate, semantics and terminology. And so the, the TMDL documents take benthic flux and atmospheric deposition into account for the total amount that the estuary can be loaded. But they still have the amount that we need to address for uh, regulatory compliance as the same as what the MEP report found. One thing they do that's different is <clears throat> where there is a positive, I should say negative, where the benthic flux is removing nitrogen, they do not count that as a negative. They don't give us credit for it. They, in their section on conservatism, say they're going to call that zero. So they're not giving us a credit for what the MEP report found if they found the benthic flux is a, a net sink of nitrogen. Where it's a net source of nitrogen, however, guess what they do? It gets added. They include it, <laughs> yeah. of course. So they don't believe it if it's negative. They but don't they believe it if it's positive. Okay. Regulatory science <laughs> at its finest. Well, does benthic flux only what's at the sediment water interface, or does benthic flux include plant growth? That's at the. It's net. And, and uh, you see what I'm saying. So if you go to West Falmouth Harbor, you see these enormous macroalgal mats, which are benthic. No, it does not include it that. Include no, it's a, it's cores. It's it, okay, it's, it, And if you it's read the MAP the, reports, you sh you'll see exactly how they yeah. do this. They do cores. They incubate. Yeah. They do basically what can. Right. When they use so a mass they spec, benthic, they do the nitrogen it's argon. It's the sediment. Yes, it's, it's the sediment contribution. The benthic, yeah. It's the sediment contribution. Okay. Uh, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is going through these <clears throat> was the inclusion of on-site systems as structural improvements. So if you go into the document, there's a section, um, let me see, I'm looking at the Wild Harbor one under, they have that climate, climate change, <clears throat> and then they talk about uh, Mass DEP's implementation guidance report. And in that report, wastewater treatment includes on-site yeah. That, that, that's not new. They, they've always thought that was an option, but they've never approved one that would ever work. <coughs> I, think, <coughs> I think in the sense that we've been looking at structural, infra you know, at infrastructure that's centralized treatment and IAs, I thought it was interesting that they included, they also include tidal flushing and channel oh. dredging and inlet alteration, oh. right oh, in black and white in this TMDL document as appropriate solutions. So I thought, and that, that's on page 30 of the, of the Wild Harbor, and, and, and each of them include that. Uh, and, they, and they don't talk about non-traditional, they don't talk about PRBs and they don't talk about shellfish in their solutions. Um, the, other thought, the other thing I'd like to highlight in going through this is their monitoring plan includes a statement that the ongoing monitoring will be reviewed and could be cut in half. And they don't say whether it's half of the monitoring stations, half of the constituents, or half of the times that the monitoring is done, but they are making a broad statement that the, a water quality monitoring program could be cut in half for ongoing compliance. And yeah. it, as much <coughs> I thought it was a very interesting comment. Right. And, and it's duplicated. Uh, it, in every report. It, in all the reports. I looked at that very carefully. Uh, slight word smithing from one report to the next, but, but the half the current effort shows up in yeah. each one. It's a lot of boilerplate. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's obviously a, an enormous amount of boilerplate. And yes. read through this and they, they've they, just... They got Tashmoo Pond in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then I'm trying to remember the one I found in the Quisset Harbor one. Oh, Westport. There's, yes, there's Westport. reference to Westport right. River and Estuary <laughs> right. on page 29 yes, in the Quisset Harbor too. one. Um, the one thing they weren't able to do with cut and paste is physically move Quisset Harbor. In the Quisset Harbor one, they have it located on Nantucket Sound facing <laughs> yep. south. Did you, know, did you see that? Yeah, there are a bunch of editorial, and I guess that's a question. Are we going to comment on... No. Edit, edit, are we going to edit this for them? No. No. No, but okay. uh, there's some... 
philosophical thing. So. <laughs> Leave it in there, and then if they ever use it against you, you can say, well, look who wrote this. They think Quizzes Harbor faces an anti so. uh, There's a, a, you know, a couple of things that you mentioned, see, and you know, brushed over about, particularly about benthic flux. I mean, in West Falmouth Harbor, the negative number is huge. So in West Falmouth, it's huge. Task I mean, to in, deal in, with West Falmouth Harbor. in Wild, it's, it's minus huge. 11. When the uh, well, do we want to push when, back on when that? the TMDL is like ten, so mm. you know it's point. like it's huge. I mean, it's, it would be it, it puts the task on this town yeah. way up, and that like by twenty five percent higher than what it was. I mean, this is a big deal by doing that. Secondly, um, it doesn't appear that they made any adjustment for although it's a small, not it's not nearly like this, but it's the atmospheric deposition has been reduced Reduce. because of the atmosphere change. <coughs> so I don't know if that's been, but generally speaking, it's 7% or 2% or something. So it's not a, not a big deal, but I don't know if they went to any effort to They did, They kept the MEP numbers. Yeah. They so just use the MEP. They okay, use the so MEP the numbers. Ones. So we should think about pushing back on these two points. And then they're going to, and what they're going to say about atmospheric deposition is it cancels out development. Okay. Between two. Yeah, I know, but, but, two but, <laughs> but the build out is in the MEP reports. I mean, it's not like, yeah. So they should say that in this so, report if, if that's their position. Yeah. So, but but this, uh, but the, like West Falmouth Harbor is just an example. I only I didn't bring them all up, but but when you look at this from the MEP report, mean Wild Harbor, West Falmouth Harbor. Okay. It's minus eleven point one. Right, but we're looking at the TMDL for Wild Harbor, which yeah, also this was Wild Harbor Quisset Right, right, no, right. But he, he, he's looking at West. No, Falmouth. I'm just saying that if if they are talking about oh, the, the negative. Yeah. But the benthic flux has dropped, and they just assume zero. Yeah. We're, you know, they're going to get to West. But we're going to get to West Falmouth Harbor, and if suddenly they come out with this report for that, then we're going to be. Well, there already is a the TMDL. The TMDL has been set for West Falmouth. That the bureaucracy has moved ahead, and, and they right. sort of picked and chose which particular <laughs> estuaries they were going to. Right, right. Get the TMDL has been set. Yes. But to achieve that TMDL, yeah. we're going to have to remove I all, all yeah, of that he's, benthic he's yes. thing. Yeah. But it's so pertinent to Wild Harbor, which is right. what we're reviewing right now, right. and it's the same issue. It's a big number. Okay. It's, it's 10 or something. I don't right. know. It's, right. 10 okay. it's 10 so or 11. So, okay. so I can give you Wild Harbor. So the question is, do we want to push back on that point? I mean, do, do we ever get the raw data for the benthic flux? Is that in, I didn't, I didn't dig deep into the appendices, but, no. you know, sediments are very, heterogeneous. I wouldn't be surprised if they took four cores if they varied by, you know, two orders of magnitude. You know, some were negative, some were positive, and that's the average. Yep. You know, that's one of my issues with this report. There's no uncertainties on any of the, the numbers. Right. That's and they report point. them to three or four significant yes, figures. Yes, that's our yeah. <laughs> complaint. So the MEP report oh. You can, so in the MEP report, they tell you exactly where they did the cores and they give you the average. They don't give you the individual core data, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you saw Ken had error bars on his. Yes, he did. Yep. It's not too much to ask. But, right. Right. So, but the, it's uh, really important with, in terms of this sediment flux. Yeah. It may be yeah. an average of 11, but no. some areas might have been significantly positive. If we were going to make a comment, they're due by June 9th. Um, yes. Okay. And our next meeting is June 1st. So if SIA were to compile comments from the committee or, or the committee should send paragraphs of what they think are the issues. Yeah, I think if you, you guys should send me your comments. Yeah. And then we yeah. can. Uh, yeah. and bring a draft in on the first. Bring, bring a draft in, in on the first. Or, or, or have it circulated it so that we can vote on it on the yeah. first. Right. Perfect. Can you clarify something for me about the negative benthic flux? Maybe. Do they ignore, if it's negative, do they ignore it at the beginning and never bring it into their calculations? Or is it that if they bring it in and the calculations come out that the removal, the, the man-made removal has to be negative, then they say, oh, no, it's not really negative. We don't want you to add stuff. It's zero. Which one is it? It is the former. And what they, they just ignore it. Yeah. They, what they account. have is, is they have the MEP says you have to remove X number of kilograms of controllable load, stormwater, fertilizer, and septic systems. That number is from MEP based on what they call the controllable load. 
then what the TMDL document does is has a column for benthic flux and has a column for atmospheric deposition and takes the removal target, the benthic flux, and the atmospheric deposition and gives you a TMDL. If the benthic flux is a positive number, it's added. If it's a negative number, it's zero. And they add the atmospheric deposition. <coughs> now, this is all based on the removal target from the MEP that takes into consideration negative benthic flux. Negative benthic or flux positive or positive benthic flux and the atmospheric deposition. So frankly, what I was going to say is I, I don't think that arguing with them about the credit for the benthic flux um, is going to fly. I mean, because they're going to say, well, but that number, that negative number is also included, is also captured in the removal target in sort of a modeling by the, by the modeling way. Yeah, but, but if but there's later processing of it, yeah, and they use the positive values but not the negative, that doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. Well, we can raise it. <clears throat> All right, so the plan is going to be uh, send comments, and we will compile the comments and review them at the next meeting. That's good. Uh, any further discussion? Mm, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.